All right, everybody, welcome. Looks like it is the top of the hour. You are still there, John, right? I am, <clears throat> yes. Okay, well, let's get started. Let me remind you that we are recording these um, classes and they are placed on restorationarchives.com and you have to go to the regional meeting section. And uh, so all of the weeks uh, since week one um, are posted already. And so with that, uh, you can review them at any time. So um, let's I'll turn it over to you, John, and we'll get started. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing where we left off was on slide 33. <clears throat> and just a quick review of that. We'll see how far we can get today so we can move a little faster. But I had said that in my mind, this is the most important of all of the sacred calendars. It seems to be one by which the whole solar system was designed, which by the way, the Mayans taught that the calendar was first, this calendar. And when I first read that, I thought, wow, these guys are really crazy on calendars. And then I realized, of course, it was designed first because the solar system's a big clock and they're going to have and Adam and Eve, they're going to have a Savior come, they're going to have a second coming. And when you plan out all those things, you want a calendar, you need a planning calendar. This looks like one of the main planning calendars. Last time we viewed how there's 20 pictures, each of which represents a step in life. And that how all the steps from conception to death only are six steps. Birth is the third step, so birth to death is three steps. Temple, dragon, serpent, and skull. You see on around about the four to five o'clock positions on the circle there. Some of them may be ordinances. The priests were a little sketchy on what they all are, but they're the steps of life. Then there's a 13-day cycle, and they turn together like those gears in the picture. And it takes 260 days, which is 20 times 13, for those to come back to the beginning position. So that is where we left off. And it just goes round and round. There's never any extra days put in. Uh, it's not tracking the planets. Like I said, the planets look like they're designed. They, they're already tracked automatically by this. <clears throat> 13 divides all of the periods of the, prop, uh, of the planets rather evenly, and it, it, it works really well. If you look at where this is set up, these gears, it's on light, which is the beginning of the picture cycle, and one. So the way you read this day is one light. The day after, you can see when that turns will be two wind. And for what we're going to talk about tonight, notice that the day before, the last day of the cycle, is 13 flower. The, these people had the concept of zero. And in their mind, 13 flower was like a zeroth day. And it was the last day. In section 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's verse 30, the Lord says that in everything he's cre created, the first is the last, and the last is the first. And so, so for some re purposes, the 13th flower is, well, I call it the zeroth day, but it's like a first day. Okay, now you can turn to the next slide, 34. And for those following this that maybe just have the audio, these slides are all on my website on the right-hand side of the front page under the square at the top of the right column that says tutorial. Okay, this slide says the day one light is followed by two temple, three, two wind, three temple, and can see it by visualizing these wheels. So we just showed that. But here I actually write it out, and I'm giving you the first introduction here to holy days. Uh, when things, when dates are in red, and this is for all of the calendars, they all have major holy days and minor holy days. We saw that in the priest's calendar. 
now on this calendar, uh, red, 13 flower and one light are both major holy days. And then seven deer is a minor. We'll talk about exactly which are which soon, but this is an introduction to realize it'll turn out that the days number one, seven, and 13 are always at least minor holy days. And then some of them are special and are major. But anyway, that's how it works. And, and if that seems, you might expect it to be like months, like the first of light, second of light, third of light. And it's not like that as much as this is like Tuesday, the first of the, of the month, Wednesday, the second, Thursday, the third. You know, it's, it's like we do the same thing with days of the week. They rotate together. We just don't think of it this way. Okay, let's go to the next slide, 35. And this is where I draw, I have a little picture. I try to find fun pictures for these things, which is sometimes easier than others. But here I swear I say that days one, seven, and 13 are always holy. And so here are the, there's uh, seven of those 20 pictures. And if they combine with one or 13, seven is always a minor holiday. But if the first or the last, one or 13, is on light, wind, temple, serpent, reed, eagle, or flower. Those are the key dates in life, and those are the key dates in the circle. Uh, and a lot of them are during life. Light, just a quick review, light is for conception, wind is quickening when the spirit enters the babies in the womb, temple's birth, serpent is rebirth, reed is resurrection. So those, you can see where those are the key dates, whereas death is not so much in the others. Okay, next slide, 36. All right, quiz question on just reading a clock. For those that have forgotten, this is an analog clock, <laughs> in case you're all digital now, but the question is, where is the zero on a clock? And to show you how it can be confusing, which is earlier, 11.30 a.m. or 12.30 a.m.? And if you don't think about clocks, you, tell, you want to say, well, 11.30 is before 12.30. But no, it's not. 12.30 a.m. is in the middle of the night. 11.30 a.m. AM is just before noon. So what's going on with that? How come? Is that messed up or is that good? And oh, I have the answer upside down on the left. The answer is 12 midnight. 12 midnight is the zero point on the clock. That 12, you could put a zero there. Uh, that, and the first hour begins, the first hour of the day begins at midnight. And when the, when the little hand gets to the one, it's the end of the first hour, not the beginning. As simple as a clock is, you need to think about this stuff once in your life. So what one o'clock is the end of the first hour, beginning of the second hour, and hence before that 12 was really the beginning of the first hour. It's the zero point. So just, can think, just think about that 12 is really like a zero. <coughs> okay, next. <clears throat> it's important because that's how they're going to, uh, to think of it. This is a whole sacred round. There's all 20 pictures and all 13 days. But look at the, well, first I'll read it. The sacred round is composed, oh yeah, this is important. It's composed of 20 tracenas, and the tracena is the 13-day period. Each beginning on a day 13, like our day begins at 12, midnight. And the name of the Tresina is the name of the first glyph. So the very first day, really, of a sacred round starts on 13 flower, just like our, our day starts at 12 o'clock midnight. That's the beginning of, beginning of the first starts on 13 flower. It's tricky, but anyway, 
the name of that whole set of 13 days is flower. It's named for the zeroth day. You won't find this in almost any other book. Um, archaeologists aren't concerned about things like this, and they'll just, uh, they'll have, they'll, they'll assume, they don't even line it up as 20 tracinas. They, almost every book I've ever seen lines it up as, tw as 13 vientinas. That they, they think it's groups of 20 because the 20 pictures go round and round. But none of the native tribes think of this sacred round as 13 sets of 20. They all think of it this way, and, and they all use these names. For instance, instead of always saying that this day is, first day is 13 flower, the zeroth day, the first day is one light, second day two wind, a lot of them will just call this the whole tracina, or they call, might call it a week, the whole tracina flower, and they'll say such and such happened on the third, fourth, and fifth days of the flower tracina. And so they use it that way also, like we'll say the third or fourth day of a month. Anyway, this is a little detail that you don't, you can probably skip and don't have to, you won't be tested on this. <laughs> Uh, but just to understand, this is extremely important to all the Native Americans. And this is the calendar that I, it seems to me that God is using the most in his planning. So it's important to learn something about. Okay, now, next slide, 38. <clears throat> the, there's uh, the question now, you already understand there's never any leap days in a sacred round. And we saw with the priest calendar that in a, in a calendar that's a simply a day count that's not tracking <laughs> under the moon or anything, all you need to know is what one day is. You need to know when the day starts, and this day starts at dawn, it turns out. But um, if, you can, if you can pinpoint one day on the calendar, then you know every day in history. So, and you'll see, you see in my work that all of these sacred days when people are born, and, and I've got pu published on my website 200, more than 200 events. They're all on these holy days. There's no fudging around. Uh, you can't push things around to make them fit up by putting in a leap year or something. Once you pick one day, it's set for all through history. Okay, they're here in four pictures, I'm going to do a, just, I'm going to just about get all the information we need to set it. There's a lot of debate, debate about the birth of Christ. Uh, scholars have worked on this forever. There's almost nothing in the Bible about exactly when he's born. There's a lot about when he had his ministry. They tell you exactly when he's baptized, I mean, to the, to the season of the year. And all the, all the four Gospels agree to the day on the day he's crucified and the day he is resurrected, being a Friday and a Sunday, respectively. But the only people who knew the birthday were a few shepherds. It was really on the hush because... Um, God knew that Herod would try to kill him, and sure enough, as soon as Herod found out, they'd slaughter all the little kids. So it's pretty secret when he was born. Luke got from Mary some details, but I'm going to go a different route here. I'm going to use the uh, some of the Aztec tradition. So here we go, slide 38. The Aztec belief, they had someone come called the Feathered Serpent. And, and you can tell it's Jesus Christ who came right after the resurrection, uh, with, uh, within a year after the resurrection. They say he was born on the day one read. Now, I talked to you before about an Indian's birthday is the name of the day they're born on. I mean, they're, the other way, their they're private say, sacred name is the name of the day he's born on. So if the name of Feathered Serpent was one reed, then that means he was born on one reed. 
Reed was the symbol for resurrection. So he's born on the day of one resurrection. Now, uh, I'm just saying here, Jesus was born as Passover began. I just say the date. And then these four pictures are four reasons. So the result is, he's born as Passover began on Wednesday, the 5th of April, Gregorian, after sunset. Because it's after sunset and because it's a Hebrew calendar, mostly you, uh, we all call this April 6th because the after sunset, April 5th, Wednesday, is considered Thursday, April 6th. So the day to celebrate his birth is April 6th. But technically, it's just like we hold Christmas pageants. When? Do we hold it at the end of December 25th? No. You hold it December 24th on the night before. That's when the shepherds come. So even on a Christmas pageant, technically we're saying he's born on the, the evening of the 24th, but you have a big party the next day. Same thing. With that in mind, picture one says, Passover celebrates the birth of both Israel and the Messiah. <clears throat> I've got whole articles on that. That was kind of a secret. The Lord knew that his people would never follow him, would never keep his birthday. So he made it their birthday too. Passover is famous for what? It's famous for being the exodus when Israel, the country, was born in a day, leaving the womb of Egypt. Uh, it's actually a few days. They, they leave at first, and then they go through the water. It's like the breaking of the water at birth. And then they go into the wilderness out of the dark womb. Egypt means darkness. And uh, anyway, Israel was born technically on the day that it broke through the water and it's out in the wilderness. And wilderness represents the world. Passover was both the birthday of Israel, the nation. It's also Israel, the man. He was born on Passover, Jacob. And it's the Savior's birth. Okay. The only thing that most people have to date the birth of Christ is there is an eclipse uh, of the moon before Herod died <clears throat> and everybody assumes that's the one in about 4 BC. A much better eclipse is in December of 1 BC that, and, there, and Herod died about February of 1 AD 1. There's no year zero so the year after 1 BC is AD 1. And anyway, Christ is born right about that time. Uh, third picture says Christ was born in early April during lambing season. The only time the shepherds are out with their lambs is for about one to two weeks in the first half of April. That's when all the lambs are born. People have tried to stretch that and they have contorted arguments to put it in December, but that's not what happened. That's in April. And then the real not solid date in the Bible is that Christ is the fourth picture. Christ was baptized at age 29 in the year AD 29. He was almost 30. It said he's beginning to be about 30 is what the scripture says. And if you go back 20 years before AD 29, it's, they don't have a zero, so it's one BC. <clears throat> so I put all that together and I do this whole debate in one slide. He's born late on the 5th of April, 1 BC. So hold any questions till the end if you have some. And, and I've already got a few listed, but let's go to slide 39. Whoops, I'm clicking on yours and that won't work. There we go. This again shows that graph of, if you know one date in history, it determines all other dates. It's like a gear rolling a rack. Opinion rolling on a rack is the gear names for it. Nobody ever jumps or skips a day. We've talked before, there's a Julian day. Every day in history is numbered. And so the correlation I'm going to use, and I call it the one read correlation of how I, I uh, uh, connect 
the sacred round with 260 days, how do I connect it to our calendar? It's right here, Julian Day, 1,721,155, which is Wednesday, April 5th, 1 BC. That is the day one read. Remember, one read starts at, 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 in the morning. So that whole night is on one read, whatever time of night he was born. That's it. That, so from that, that's how I correlate everything. Now, you ask, well, how does that correlate with what all of the anthropologists, what are the, what's the standard correlation? Do I agree with the, the world or not on this? Go to the next slide, 40. <clears throat> My one read correlation to the Julian day differs by one day from the one almost everybody uses, which is called the GMT. And it fits into an open slot. It turn, now I read below, what does GMT stand for? Now this is a little technical and if you want to go get a pop during this slide, it's okay. But I need this. I have to show my stuff is, is technically sound and I'm just not wandering off in the wilderness on what I think, you know, let's fit it to Jesus, you know, and not to the, to the uh, documents. No, it's not what I'm doing. Here's, let's get this. The GMT is the Goodman Martinez, Martinez Thompson correlation of the sacred round. There were three different, researchers in this back at about 1930. And they all had their own correlation. If you look up at the picture, uh, Thompson had it, had this day that I'm talking about on one read. They had it a couple days before on 11 dog. Martinez had it four days after that on two Jaguar. And Goodman had it three days after that on, on six, three Eagle. There's a six day spread. Now they were pretty happy about being within six days. They were trying to figure out first just what year it was. And you know, it's like if you said, you know, when was the airplane invented? Well, was it the first of January, the fifth or sixth? No, we don't care. It's within a few days, first week of January. That's good enough for government work, you know, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So when they came to pick a correlation, to be fair to all of them, they didn't pick any one of what the three people thought. They picked an average day in between. If you look, GMT is like two, you know, a, a blank spot up to Thompson and a blank spot down to Martin and Goodman. They picked a day that none of those three thought was right. That proves alone that they weren't care. They were not caring about getting it exactly right. Uh, so the one they use, nobody thought was correct. That's my important point here. The one I say is 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 correct, and it's extremely important. It's the birthday of Christ, and it's the all the birthdays of all these prophets. You got to get it right. This is God's calendar. It's in one of the two open slots. It's right there. So mine disagrees only by one day from GMT. And that's a lot of words on that, but you won't hear them again. I'm just saying it's accurate, it's correct, and nobody else wanted it exactly right. Okay, slide 41. Oh, I got to watch the clock. Time is up on that. We're ready for 20 questions. So we will start on slide 41 next time, if you want to note that, Glenn. And we are going to questions. Uh, first of all, now I'm not letting anybody, does any, well, I'm, let's go through this and, I'll, and there'll be time at the end for other questions. So hold your questions still. Some people write in their questions to me, and I like to take those first, partly because they went to the trouble to write, partly because I've had a minute to think about the answers. So I've got, I think, five questions that have come in. <clears throat> and remember, in the second half of this, we can talk about anything, and we've already started on the start calendar. And last week, I had a major paper come out on the dragon last Sunday, a week ago, and uh, there's a question or so on that, which we haven't really discussed here. 
but I said I'd try to answer them all. So here it is, first question. The first question is, well, last week I answered a question about the, the uh, period of Venus. And we'll talk about that more. And now, by the way, there's even another new calendar. But no, let's not, don't go to the calendar stuff now because this is not what her question is. Uh, so the question has to do with the Venus. I don't have a slide on this one. <clears throat> on why the Venus cycle is different as seen from the Earth than is usually reported. And we answered that last week, and it's because we're on a moving Earth. This question has to do with, they did some research and found out that as Venus goes around to these points, there's Venus lines up for the sun five times in eight years. And if you draw a picture of where those five times in eight years are, it draws a five-pointed star. And their question is, would the ancients have known that? Because to really see it, you have to be up above outside the solar system to look down. Well, the answer is yes, they for sure knew about that. Uh, and you don't have to be above to see it. And you see it the same way the person who asked the question did. And that is, you do have to know that the Earth is going around the sun, I guess. Well... No, you could do it with the sun going around the earth. Either way, if you draw in eight years, if you draw the five points, you'll have five equally spaced points around a circle. And if you just draw, and then if you draw lines between this point was the first place where the Venus year was, cycle, and this point was the second, and if you connect the first to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, it will draw a five-pointed star. Uh, so yeah, they would have known about that. And the second question is, do I have any thoughts on the importance of that? I don't know much about that. I understand that the five-pointed star was called the Lesser Seal of Solomon, and the six-pointed star with the two triangles was called the Greater Seal of Solomon. So Solomon, who was wise and knew a lot of things, knew something about both of those stars. Unfortunately, Solomon goes sour in spite of all of his wisdom, and he's supposed to be the one that wrote the witchcraft Bible. So now, unfortunately, both the pen and this called a pentagram and a hexagram in is more words that I associate more with the witchcraft side instead of five and six pointed star it's called the star of the six pointed is called the star of david it's on the israel flag uh hexagram stuff and pentagram are used in witchcraft i don't know anything about that in witchcraft but i do know that satan copies an awful lot of things and that these had great religious meaning first whoops are we still I guess we're still, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. Somebody's finding neat pictures. Oh, good. This is a good one to show, pictures you're showing. Uh, so, yes, uh, it turns out, I don't want to spend too long in this, but the five-point star is magic. You can, they, you can put one inside the other, and oh, magic, isn't that funny? Magic, and that's what, anyway. You can put one inside the other. It has the phi ratio and the angles. It's, it's absolutely amazing. This picture here is what Venus actually traces out. And you get these five pointed. See, if you just drew a circle around that and had these little points, then it'd be a five uh, pointed star. But if you look at how it actually appears to move, you get all these beautiful rosette patterns. And and see rosette. The roses have the five. Anyways, gorgeous stuff. I don't understand the meaning of these things. I am more just into the calendar. So let's move to the next question, which is question three. Oh, it's about my last uh, paper uh, on the dragon. And in that paper, it's talked about that the eagle is the symbol of a revelator, 
and that's and it, there's a lot of evidence that John the Revelator symbol was an eagle. That's not too surprising. But it talks about the serpent is a symbol of the prophet, and the question is, where did I get that? Because I don't have a footnote on that. And the answer is, this is really all in the scriptures. Uh, and I, it was sort of just discovered slowly over a bunch of years. But there's all kinds of hints. And let me mention a few that are right out of the scriptures. Um, let's see. Well, I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, the Lord, the Lord says things like to his apostles. He said, "You should be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves." Now, why did he pick those animals? Do you do you associate wisdom with a serpent? Um, it turns out the wisdom is not only a prophet. The serpent's not only a prophet; it is the symbol of wisdom also. And in Proverbs by Solomon, who understood this, he talks about <clears throat> uh, a wise man's heart. And that's what he was given. He was given a wise man's heart. He said, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Uh, the word Dan, the 12 tribes, Dan means serpent. And his, his uh, symbol on his shield was a serpent. And Dan, I, I don't mean Dan means serpent. Dan means judge. And a judge needs to have a wise heart. The heart of the scorpion, which was considered a serpent, is the heart of wisdom. Anyway, that's all on wisdom. Uh, if you look at the actual trinity of God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, Jesus played actually the role of a prophet when he was on earth. He didn't do a lot of prophets don't prophesy. That's an important, he has a rule. Revelators are the ones that can see the future and see the past. John the Revelator tells you about the future. Uh, a prophet's job is to tell you the word of God now. They, they, they say this is follow this is where we're going to move. Moses is the classic prophet, and he says, you know, we're leaving, take your stuff, and he leads them day by day, and he never knows ahead very far where he's going. He's, he he's, he's lives in the present, not in the future. The serpent on the staff with Moses represented Christ. Christ is in the role of a prophet. Moses prophesied that someday a great prophet would come and everybody should listen to him or they would be cut off. Christ was the great prophet. He wasn't called a great revelator or a great seer. A lot of it, what's in my articles, most LDS have never thought about the difference between a prophet, seer, and revelator. They're three very different words. A seer is both a prophet and a revelator together, and that's in in the Mosiah chapter 8, verse about 15, 16. Um, so that's the one we have in Scripture. Anyway, there's not a lot of clear evidence, but when he said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, Christ is the serpent and the Holy Ghost is the dove. We use a dove for the Holy Ghost, the symbol of the Trinity. So wise as serpents, harmless as doves. See how there's a connection there that we can overlook. Uh, one other thing, when, when Moses throws the rod down, it turns into a serpent, which is his symbol. It could have been an, an eagle, and uh, that'd be pretty cool, and have the eagle kill all the other serpents of the other guys or whatever. Anyway, um, here's one final one. When you do realize it's a serpent and pick out the main star in the constellation of the serpent, in just my last couple times ago post on my tutorial, it's shown that the day that John the Baptist, who was sit told, the Savior said, of all those born of women, the greatest prophet was John the Baptist. 
So he was the greatest prophet, not the greatest seer, not the greatest revelator. He was the greatest prophet. The day he dies on both the star and the uniform star calendar was the day of the prophet, the brightest star in the serpent. So he's double serpent. So when you put it all together, there's a lot of evidence for it. I did not put any of that in footnotes. Next. Next, two more questions, then I'll turn it back to everybody else. And we'll have a little time. Fourth question. Uh, where did the star calendar come from? It comes from the Book of Enoch, where in the Book of Enoch, he says there's 364 stars in the calendar. Each star is a day. I might have said this when, when we first started. I think I did. But each, calendar, each, uh, each day of, of a 364-day year is a star, and each star represents one of God's servants. And I've told you that I'm working hard to figure out what the stars are, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out who the 364 men are, because I don't have a clue on more than about four, four or five of them. Okay, and the last question is, you mentioned in class, sacred round is the most important calendar. What would you consider second most? <clears throat> I would say the Hebrew, the corrected perpetual Hebrew calendar is the second most important. Uh, more things are scheduled on those two than, than, than any of the others. If I had to pick a third, it'd probably be the Venus calendar, but maybe that's just because it's so important in the Savior's life. But it's important all through history on prophets and patriarchs. So those are all the questions written in. We now still have six or seven minutes, if, uh, or maybe more. Are there any questions from the group now? Yes. So I had a question about right at the beginning, how the, um, You've got the 20 going around and then the one through 13. Is there a pattern that shows up, say, in Christ's life, where the first, so it's like one light, and then somewhere down the road it ends up being 13 light. Does that happen? Oh, yes. Um, in me... the whole idea of first shall be last and last shall be first concept. Okay. Am I back on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's very important. Thank you. I, here's something I didn't say. The one represents the beginning, and 13 represents not only the end, but the high point, the most important. The, it's almost more like the top of the pyramid instead of going back down like that picture I showed of up to seven and down to 13. And so the day for birth, for instance, is one temple. Because one is the beginning of life, and temple is the day for birth. As far as one light and 13 light, the day on which Jesus is transfigured, where he shines like the sun, that day was 13 light. Uh, isn't that awesome? It's 13 light. And, and these wheels just go around and around. But... And to show that's not just a random coincidence, the day on which, yeah, see, you can see the 13, I'm, oh, I'm showing on mine, but it's not, you can see 13 light is three up from the bottom. And so that's the beginning of that week. The day on which Jesus is baptized was on 13 water. So see, water, I mean, it's the highest day of water. Uh -huh. uh, and so, so the symbolism is just all over the place. Um, the day the dragon is when evil enters, and the day that Herod issues the order for Jesus for the babies to be killed is on one dragon, and uh, and that's also on one Venus when they start a trip going down to uh, Egypt on the Venus calendar. Anyway, so the numbers and the pictures are important and they, they line up on the days 
and it's all through history. I mean, when you start to see a hundred of the, 200 of these, like I have posted, and a lot of these really sacred events will be wholly on uh, seven or eight calendars. Every one of those combinations of holy days tells part of the story. And sometimes you can just read the whole story by looking at what all the little dates are, which is another reason to have so many calendars. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it's really important. And the symbolism. Any other questions? So do you have something where like something happened to say, so you had written about uh, Christ being born on, what was the grass? And then is there something on the 13, was it one grass that he was born on? Or he, He's on one, one reed, the one right yeah, after. one reed. And so do you have something where it comes around and then it's 13 read that fulfilled something in his life. Here's, here's, what hap here's what happens with these birth and resurrection dates. Remember, it's a secret. His birth date was meant to be a secret. Satan has those something about this sacred round. It came over with the Jaredites. And, and, and one reason, they, and it was a lot of wisdom. Satan obviously knows about this. So Jesus isn't going to have anything too simple for him to figure out, as, as Denver has pointed out. And so they did a, what I consider a swapping of dates. Jesus, he is the resurrection and the life. They have him born on one reed, which means one resurrection. But then the day he's resurrected is on 13 Temple. 13 being the highest, like resurrection. See, the one is like birth and 13 is like resurrection. But they swapped the reed, the, the resurrection, and the, the temple is birth. So he's born on one resurrection, and then he resurrects on 13 birth, which was temple. So they do cute stuff like that where you can see it was intended one is a witness of the other. It's not random. Mm -hmm. There's two or three witnesses of everything that this was planned out. But on the other hand, they didn't want it known ahead. And so it's, as Denver always points out, the, the prophecy is, is a witness after the fact that it had been planned. It was on schedule. It was on the calendar. Nobody delayed it. And it wasn't a random thing when Christ was res or was crucified and resurrected. It had been on the planning calendar on many calendars from the beginning. One more question. I have one really quickly. Um, as pertaining to the Native American Indians here on this continent, is there a calendar that they seem to follow? Because they talk a lot in their writings about the Aztecs and, and their ties to the Aztecs and how closely their prophecies and teachings align. Do they, what calendar are you aware of that they utilize? All of them, all of them used this sacred round. If you look at where they are, the Aztecs used it. And I have the Aztec names. Quetzalcoatl is the Aztec name for Christ. Kukulkan is the what? The Mayan. Uh, Vocha. Votan. Anyway, they all have their names. They all use the same 260 day count. Sometimes they would put in different pictures from whatever their local. So one would have a. Instead of a dragon, they have an iguana or a lizard. And sometimes a parrot instead of a monkey, because, you know, they look kind of the same if you look at the... Uh, they, they can look similar. Anyway, I've got a... I think I have said it first. I've got a book with 50 tribes from Alaska down to Chile, Tierra del Fuego. And I've got a comparison of all of their sacred rounds, but they all use this one as their primary calendar. And then they can use something else for the years. This does not measure years or seasons. Uh, 
it does major, measure gestation periods. 260 days is uh, pretty close to an average gestation period for birth. But um, so they all had either moons or suns or something else that varied, but this was very consistent. And when I read the books today, they almost all use the GMT correlation. I don't know if that's because they've really handed it down and that's the one they use. Or if they got it from us. I don't think they got it from us. So that really, really but see, it's so easy to get off a day, especially when it starts at dawn and then somebody else will switch and start at night and then you go back and switch and start at dawn. Now, which one? Was it forward or backward? Um, so the... Most of the ones I know use the GMT correlation, but they all use this. Okay, it is quarter two. So let's stop, And uh, but I'm glad we've had some people listening and hope you're still interested. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining too. And as a reminder, like we mentioned at the beginning too, it is on the restorationarchives.com calendar under regional meetings. Um, all of these recordings uh, are there that you could find. So thanks for joining and hope to see you next week. Thanks, John. You bet. See ya. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.